Hello you beautiful misfits, my name is Matt and this is Pixelburn, where I usually take a snarky look at the week's gaming news. Except there's been only one thing occupying my attention this week. How could I not talk about digital homicide? I mean really, how could I not? The notorious purveyors of steam clogging, asset flipped digital shovelware rather shot themselves in the foot this past week with a somewhat rash decision to pick a legal fight with Valve. Yes, that Valve. The same one that's based in Seattle, owns Steam, has more money than God, and will never release Half-Life 3. Ah, but forgive me, some of you may not be aware of who Digital Homicide are. Yeah, I should probably explain that, shouldn't I? Christ, where do I start? Ostensibly an indie studio based in Arizona, owned, managed by, and entirely consisting of two people, Robert Romine and James Oliver Romine Jr., Digital Homicide first shot to wider fame, or infamy rather, with the release of their first game, The Slaughtering Grounds, on Steam in October of 2014. A bad first-person shooter made badly, in Unity, and packed to the brim with Unity store assets thrown together without rhyme, reason or artistry. Not that using pre-made store assets in and of itself is at all bad, of course, not at all. Many good developers use pre-made stuff for their games. Filmmakers do it too. Those futuristic red space chairs in 2001 A Space Odyssey were all a standard item from a 1960s French furniture manufacturer while all the drinking glasses used in the Mos Eisley Cantina scene in Star Wars were bought from a market stall on London's North End Road by none other than author Robert Rankin. So to be perfectly clear, people who contribute good work to the Unity Store are talented individuals and deserve to have their work rewarded, preferably by being featured in games that are actually good. Digital Homicide, however, treated the Unity Store rather like a digital pick-and-mix aisle, grabbing anything they thought looked good and dumping them into the slaughtering grounds with nary a thought to rhyme, reason, coherency or thematic consistency. Like a kid building something out of an assortment of random Lego sets and then trying to sell what they built as their own, totally 100% original creation, bricks and all. The game eventually came to the attention of Jim Boglin Botherer Sterling, formerly of Destructoid and The Escapist, who did a first impressions video of The Slaughtering Grounds where he criticised its awful frame rate, shoddy gameplay mechanics, thematic inconsistencies, shameless asset flipping, brazen, terribly implemented user graphics taken straight from Google Images, and other criticisms too numerous to list here. Indeed, it's practically impossible to talk about Digital Homicide without also mentioning Jim, simply because of how much he's done to bring their dubious antics to the public's attention. You know, in a way, they've almost come to sort of define each other, a bit like the eternal rivalry between Batman and the Joker. That is, if Batman collected pogs, and the Joker was the penny plunderer instead. In his initial video, Jim also criticised Digital Homicide themselves for removing negative opinions of the slaughtering grounds and banning anyone who criticised it from the game's Steam community forums. Digital Homicide responded with a counterpoint video that, much like their games, consisted almost entirely of other people's work, namely Jim's in this case. Digital Homicide's rebuttal was essentially Jim's original first impressions video with angry text typed over the top of it, to which Jim responded in kind with a video of his own in which he talked over their video. Digital Homicide then released another video that was simply a black screen with white text, yet still had the audio of Jim talking about their previous angry rant, dubbed over the audio of Jim describing his initial first impressions of the game and... Digital Homicide then did the totally sensible and mature thing of issuing a Digital Millennium Copyright Act claim on the original Jim Pressions video, because that wouldn't in any way blow up in their faces, would it? Not long after this, Digital Homicide invited Jim to record a discussion between them, under the pretense of clearing the air, only to try and catch him out with various half-baked gotchas and even resorting at one point to borderline doxing, presumably an attempt to intimidate him into either backing down or retracting his claims. Over the following year and a bit, Digital Homicide released seven more games, some under multiple development pseudonyms like Imminent Uprising, Victory Games LLC, MicroStrategic Game Designs, Runtime Game Network, Jerkco123, Muckfinity Games 777, Game Portal Publishing and Every Click Counts Games. That last one was originally just ECC Games, which incidentally happens to be the name of a completely unrelated Polish mobile game developer. Naturally, the real ECC games were not entirely happy with this, to put it mildly, and when they announced they were considering legal action, the imitation Arizona-based ECC games quickly changed its name to Every Click Counts instead. And that only scratches the surface of Digital Homicide's scummy misdeeds, like trying to play Steam's Greenlight system by offering free games for votes, and flogging their titles at a steep discount in bundles, 
to get more people selling the game's trading cards on Steam, for which Digital Homicide get a 10% cut on each card sold. Not forgetting also these two Tumblr accounts, now long deleted. One accused Jim of doing his own asset flipping, without any understanding that modifying Twitter's bird logo for parody or satire comes under fair use. The other outright said, we know where you live, in a somewhat sinister, creepy fashion. Both were linked to a supposed Russian developer called Ivan Ratikis of one Xenobite Studios, not to be confused with the real Xenobite Studios, who were a team of university students working on a project for their course. The imitation Xenobite, meanwhile, also had a Twitter account where they were promoting their game, Dark Hill Revengers, on Steam Greenlight. Only, as you can clearly see in this image, Ivan posted to his Twitter, the game was being published under the banner of Victory Games LLC, a known pseudonym of you guessed it, Digital Homicide. Both Tumblr pages and the fake Xenobite Twitter account were promptly deleted as soon as this connection was publicly exposed. This tete-a-tete -tete culminated in March of this year with Digital Homicide filing a suit against Jim Sterling for 10 million US dollars, claiming assault, libel and slander. They later upped it to 15 million dollars because reasons. As a result of the legal challenge against him, Jim now refrains from talking about Digital Homicide in any direct manner, although it doesn't stop him making slight little digs now and then, which if I'm totally honest I wouldn't be able to resist doing either. So with Jim left to titter on the sidelines like Kefka at a massacre, we now fast forward a bit to September 7th, Space Year Now, when Digital Homicide requested a subpoena against Valve Corporation, demanding the real identities of 100 Steam users. I guess a lawyer would feel a bit silly calling Sebastian von Fappiwank to the stand, but then the entire case was filed as pro se, which is Latin for no lawyer was stupid enough to take this case. The subpoena request was followed by an actual lawsuit issued against those same 100 Steam users seeking $18 million in punitive damages for emotional distress, financial distress and continued public humiliation caused by harassment, stalking, criminal damage, formation of a hate group, criminal impersonation and conspiracy to commit civil rights violations amongst other charges. Well, you can accuse Digital Homicide of many things, but a lack of optimism clearly isn't one of them. Except the bulk of the proof cited in the associated case documents are reviews and comments on Steam and elsewhere, detailing legitimate accounts of Digital Homicide's shitty anti-consumer behaviour. The name changing, the key giveaways in exchange for green light votes, the harassment of critics, the terrible nature of the games themselves, etc, etc. In fact, one piece of evidence included with Digital Homicide's case filing, is a screenshot of one of the Romine brothers logged into Steam under the name of a Digital Homicide pseudonym, Victory Games LLC. Sorry, did I say pseudonym? Digital Homicide prefers to call them trade names, and claims they only use them, according to the legal documents, to avoid an enormous group of harassers of which the defendants make up the core, and certainly not to sneak mountains of digital shite onto the Steam store under different names so as to escape the shadow of their own reputation. No siree. Now the case filing isn't entirely a packet of crap, mostly, but not entirely. Allegations such as this one of pirating Unity Store asset packs for example, are a tad serious since, without hard proof, they're technically libelous. They'd also be easily refuted by copies of the receipts for the asset purchases, except, now here's a thing, no such proof has ever been provided by Digital Homicide nor has a single example been included in the case filing. Perhaps Digital Homicide planned to dramatically unveil them in an actual courtroom, to the shock and amazement of the presiding judge. One also has to laugh at the comments from loyal customers, inadvertently included in the documents, who are clearly only defending Digital Homicide because they're a cheap and easy source of Steam trading cards. In short, Digital Homicide wants to sue a bunch of Steam users for leaving honest reviews of their games, which they purchased since you can't leave a Steam review on games you don't own, calling them out on shady anti-consumer business practices, and schoolyard level name calling. Look, Digital Homicide, just because some people call you idiots in various online forums doesn't mean you have to go prove them right. Bell's response to this act of insanity was short, swift and effective. The very same day Digital Homicide filed their case against their 100 anonymous Steam nemeses, Valve removed all 21 of Digital Homicide's games from the Steam store. Yep, 21. 13 of which were released this year alone. Valve's VP of Marketing, Doug Lombardi, also issued the following statement that, in the fine tradition of Valve's statements to the public, was brief and to the point. 
Valve has stopped doing business with Digital Homicide for being hostile to Steam customers. Now, you'd think Valve removing Digital Homicide's games from Steam would have been a wake-up call of sorts. You know, a clear and present indicator that maybe, just maybe, they had, as the youth of today so eloquently put it, done fucked up. No. Digital Homicide responded to Doug's statement with this blog post on their website, or at least it was on their website at one point. I'm using screen caps taken by someone else here because I can't actually find the original anymore. Nor can I find much of anything else on their site to be honest, since as you can see here, it was clearly built by someone with no knowledge of how to make a cohesive functioning website. Hmm, shoddy games, shoddy website... I'm seeing a pattern here. Anyhow, according to one of the Romine brothers at Digital Homicide, by removing us, they have taken the stance that users have the right to harass me, tell me I should kill myself, and insult my family. If I try to defend myself against said actions, then I lose my family's income. If it wasn't for two years of experience of dealing with Steam on a regular basis, this disgusting stance would seem shocking to me. The only thing that prevented me seeking legal counsel for a long list of breach of contracts, interference with business, and antitrust issues was the fear of losing my family's income. Since that has been taken away, I am seeking legal representation. Are you... Are you trying to say you're... You're going to sue Valve? Because it sounds like you want to try and sue Valve. Now, Digital Homicide. It's not my intention to sound mean or belittling here, but next to Valve, you are an ant. An ant perched on the rim of a teacup, perched on the rim of an erupting volcano on a planet that's about to explode, in a solar system whose star is about to go supernova, in a galaxy colliding with another galaxy, as the universe is ripped apart by phantom dark energy. You are the planet Lithon versus Unicron. You are Alderaan versus the Death Star. You are a medieval farming world in the targeting reticle of an exterminatus fleet. You are Tribbles trying to fight the Borg. Need I go on? One doesn't have to be a lawyer to see this is a legal challenge that doesn't need to be fought, probably shouldn't be fought, and cannot be won. I'm all for rooting for the underdog, believe me, but what you're seemingly intent on doing is, fuck it, let's get the cringingly obvious joke done and out of the way. Digital suicide! The cost of Valve's legal department's headed letter paper alone would put you in a Victorian debtor's prison. And they don't even exist anymore! They build a new one just for you! Even Mad Steve, who hangs around the end of my road, yelling at paving stones, thinks your legal intentions are ill-advised. And he lives under a railway bridge, drinks lighter fluid because he heard fluoride makes your balls fall off, and is convinced the British royal family are paedophile lizards from Sirius B. He also thinks your games are rubbish, by the way. Yes, he has a Steam account. Don't judge people by their appearance. Look, I sympathise with creators who receive negative feedback on their work. It never feels pleasant, no matter how politely it's phrased. But there are ways and means of dealing with it. Don't try and censor criticism. Report death threats and other criminal harassment to the appropriate authorities. Don't pick fights with your audience. Be gracious towards receiving critique, no matter how humbling it feels. Sure, it sucks, but tough shit. Get used to it. I've had complete strangers tell me I've got a punchable face. You don't see me trying to sue them for it. I don't have to. I mean, they're obviously wrong. You know, I could give Digital Homicide more advice on preserving grace under pressure, but I'd only be wasting my breath. With a lashing out like petulant children throwing a temper tantrum, attempting to intimidate critics, churning out cobbled together Franken games from an assembly line, lacking a smidgen of self-awareness, or refusing to accept any responsibility for their own actions, Digital Homicide have time and time again shown themselves incapable of behaving with even a shred of professionalism. In a rational universe, this legal tomfoolery, along with the rest of their frivolous cases, will be thrown out of court by a laughing judge. At least I fucking hope so, because if this somehow succeeds, whether by the intervention of an insane space god or some bizarre cosmic fluke, then the precedent it'll set is horrifying, and the world really will have gone utterly mad. In the meantime, we can at least shake our heads at this sad, sorry nonsense and, in my case, await the inevitable subpoena. That's all for this episode of Pixel Burn. If you liked it, then please do let me know by clicking the like button down below. And the subscribe button as well if you haven't already. And let your friends, family, your dog and Digital Homicide's legal team know as well. At the very least, I hope you found it tolerable. Meanwhile, until next time, as always, you can go now.